So, here we are at the Faith Mind Sutra again. Uh, this is, I think, talk number nine, and we probably have one more, and then we will be finished with the Faith Mind Sutra, though to be finished just means finished the first time through. There's always lots to get, more to get out of it as you uh, live with it and read it again and study it. So this is going to be long, but I think it's, it's good to read the whole thing through uh, up to the lines for today um, so that you have some kind of context for the lines I'm going to talk about today. The great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. If you wish to see the truth, then hold no opinions for or against anything. To set up what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. When the deep meaning of things is not understood, the mind's essential peace is disturbed to no avail. The way is perfect like vast space where nothing is lacking and nothing is in excess. Indeed, it is due to our choosing to accept or reject that we do not see the true nature of things. Live neither in the entanglements of outer things nor in inner feelings of emptiness. Be serene in the oneness of things and such erroneous views will disappear by themselves. When you try to stop activity to achieve quietness, your very effort fills your mind with activity. As long as you remain in one extreme or the other, you will never know oneness. Those who do not live in the single way fail in both activity and quietness, assertion and denial. To deny the reality of things is to miss their reality. To assert the emptiness of things is to miss their reality. The more you talk and think about it, the further astray you wander from the truth. Stop talking and thinking and there is nothing you will not be able to know. To return to the root is to find the meaning, but to pursue appearances is to miss the source. At the moment of inner enlightenment, there is a moment of going beyond appearance and emptiness. The changes that appear to occur in the empty world we call real only because of our ignorance. Do not search for the truth, only cease to cherish opinions. Do not remain in the dualistic state. Avoid such pursuits carefully. If there is even a trace of this and that, of right and wrong, the mind will be lost in confusion. Although all dualities come from the one, do not be attached even to this one. When the mind exists undisturbed in the way, nothing in the world can bother us. And when a thing can no longer bother, it ceases to exist in the old way. When no discriminating, discriminating thoughts arise, the mind ceases to exist. When thought objects vanish, the thinking subject vanishes, just as the mind vanishes, objects vanish. Things are objects because of the mind. The mind is such because of things. Understand the relativity of these two and the unity of emptiness. In this emptiness, the two are indistinguishable and each contains in itself the whole world. If you do not discriminate between coarse and fine, you will not be tempted to, to prejudice and opinion. To live in the great way is neither easy nor difficult, but those with limited views are fearful and irresolute. The faster they hurry, the slower they go, and attachment cannot be limited. Even to be attached to the idea of enlightenment is to go astray. Just let things be in their own way, and there will be neither coming nor going. Obey your own nature and you will walk freely and undisturbed. 
When thought is in bondage, the truth is hidden and everything is murky and unclear. The burdensome practice of judging brings annoyance and weariness. What benefit can be derived from distinctions and separations? If you wish to move in the one way, do not dislike even the world of senses and ideas. Indeed, to accept them fully is identical with true enlightenment. Wise ones strive for no goals, but foolish people fetter themselves. There is one Dharma, not many. Distinctions arise from the clinging needs of the ignorant. To seek mind with a discriminating mind is the greatest of all mistakes. Rest and unrest derive from illusion. With enlightenment, there is no liking and disliking. All dualities come from ignorant inference. They are life dreams or flowers in the air. It's foolish to try to grasp them. Gain and loss, right and wrong, such thoughts must finally be abolished at once. If the eye never sleeps, all dreams will naturally cease. If the mind makes no discrimination, the 10,000 things are as they are of a single essence. To understand the mystery of this one essence is to be released from all entanglements. When all things are seen equally, the timeless self-essence is reached. There are no comparisons or analogies in this ceaseless, relationless state. So that brings us to today's lines then. So the sutra continues, consider movement stationary and the stationary to be in motion. Then movement and rest disappear. When such dualities cease to exist, oneness itself cannot exist. To this ultimate finality, no law or description applies. For the unified mind in accord with the way all self-centered striving ceases, doubts and irresolutions vanish, and life in true faith is possible. With a single stroke, we are freed from bondage. Nothing clings to us, and we hold on to nothing. All is empty, clear, and self-illuminating, with no exertion of the mind's power. Here, thought, feeling, knowledge, and imagination are of no value. In this world of suchness, there is neither self nor other than self. So those are uh, our lines for today. We're going to take it line by line and see if we can uh, understand a little better. So the first line, consider movement stationary and the stationary to be in motion. Then movement and rest disappear. So basically what uh, uh, Seng San sets out here is a logical impossibility. You know, in the ordinary everyday world, something is either moving or it's still stationary. Um, but he's saying that uh, we should consider them to be interchangeable He wants us not to think of things in this way. And rather, he says, we should consider movement stationary and the stationary to be in motion. So how can we understand such an illogical teaching? Motion and stillness are dualities. They're the opposites. How can they be the same? Naturally, this statement is not going to make sense unless we also look at the line from the point of view of oneness. In the everyday world, it just doesn't compute. So it's helpful to think about how this world of oneness that we talk about so often actually comes into being. <clears throat> 
We know that the Buddhist experience of oneness grows out of the recognition of change as the basic principle of the universe. This is the Buddha's first teaching, right? Life is suffering, everything, everything changes. The inference that results from the truth of change is this. If you just say everything changes, you say, oh yeah, that's true. Hmm. But you have to think about, oh, if that's true, what does it mean once you admit that basic uh, teaching? So, Buddha goes on to reason, if everything is always changing, then nothing is the same thing from moment to moment. So that if nothing is the same, then we can't really say that that thing exists as a permanent entity, a permanent thing. Because each moment it will be slightly different. So this is the basis of the Buddhist truth of emptiness. Because things do not stay the same, because they change, then Buddhism has used the word empty to describe them. What are they empty of? They're empty of permanence. They're not always the same. So this, this is just the word that Buddhism chose, empty. You could have chosen some other word. The other aspect of reality that uh, leads Buddhists to call everything empty is that nothing can exist alone by itself. Everything exists as it is and changes only because it's in a matrix of other things. All these things are constantly changing and so because they're changing, they're influencing each other. So you have this whole universe of things that are always changing and <clears throat> as they change their influence on everything else changes and everything else is also influencing them. So it's, a, it's a, uh, an interchange of energy, of influence. So that in our minds, we can abstract one thing out of this matrix and we can think of it separately. I can abstract Oliver out of this Zendo and think of him as orange-striped cat. But the truth of the matter is Oliver does not exist as he is if he's removed from this matrix. You know, he is partially what he is because he's reacting to what's around him. And he's also influencing everything else that he comes into contact with. So this world of influence and constant interchange is what Buddhists call interdependence. So we have two principles here. We have change, which leads to emptiness, and we have um, the matrix, uh, which leads to interdependence. So from this uh, truth of interdependence, Buddhists make this further inference that if everything is inextricable from its matrix, then we can't think of the parts as separate. We have to think of the matrix, the whole thing, as the basic unit. So the matrix is one thing, really, because you can't really take any of the parts out and have it stay the same. It would be a different matrix if you took something out. So this is ba the basic idea of the net of Indra. Everything is constantly changing and constantly influencing everything else and, and being influenced by everything else. So this is the world that Sang Sun is coming from when he tells us there are no dualities. He says we should consider movement stationary and the stationary to be in, mo in motion. So from the absolute point of view, you can see 
how this can be true. If everything is empty, then there's no permanent entity to move or not move. There's nothing we can say is in motion or anything we can say is stationary. Another way to, to say the same thing would be to say that everything is both stationary and in motion at the same time. In the same way that everything is both empty and not empty and has form at the same time. You know, meditation is sometimes called the still point. T.S. Eliot says, the still point of the turning world. There is a still point, yet the universe always remains in motion and in change. It's like the ballerina who spins, whirling around, and yet that toe stays stationary on the floor in the same spot. So this is the nature of the universe. The still point is the absolute, and the dancing world is in flux around this still point. To make it personal, we could say that our mind, big mind, is always completely silent, still, and empty. This is our basic nature. This is Buddha nature. This is original nature. Sometimes it's called original nature always completely still and empty. At the same time, we all experience our small mind, much to our annoyance sometimes, where the contents are in constant motion, spinning out comment, worry, reaction, all sorts of stuff. So this is our basic nature, and it is the basic nature of the whole universe, a still point with everything in, in motion and flux around it. So that when we enlarge our way of looking at things, movement and stillness are not really dualities. They're just part of a larger whole, of a larger oneness. The first line concludes, then movement and rest disappear. When you take things that are in motion to be still and things that are still to be in motion, he concludes, then movement and rest disappear. When they're part of a larger whole, when they're both empty, they're therefore not different. Movement and stillness, movement and rest do indeed disappear when you think of in them in that way. They no longer exist as separate states. In the next line, Seng Sun goes on to say this, when such dualities cease to exist, oneness itself cannot exist. What he's saying here is when we try to grab onto either emptiness or form, oneness or two-ness, stillness or motion, and we say that either of the sides is the truth, then we always distort the truth because both are true. I often say that emptiness can't exist all by itself. There has to be something that is empty. Another way of saying this would be to say that emptiness cannot exist without form. Isn't that what the Heart Sutra tells us? Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. And this is why Sang San says, when such dualities cease to exist, oneness itself cannot exist. In the next line, he says, to this ultimate finality, no law or description applies. What is it that Sang San is calling this ultimate finality? This ultimate finality is the paradox at the heart of reality. <clears throat> it's the paradox of form is emptiness, emptiness is form. 
It's the paradox of no old age and death and no end to old age and death. Stillness is movement. Movement is stillness. You and I are the same thing, but I'm not you and you're not me. These paradoxes are not logical. They make no sense at all in our ordinary way of thinking. And yet, when we look at them deeply, we sense that they are true. No one understands it. No one can explain it. And that's why the sutra tells us in the second part of the line, no law or description applies to it. What he's saying here basically is what we say all the time. Words and letters don't reach it. Can't get at it from your, um, <clears throat> from your ordinary mind. You can't get at it through laws or descriptions or explanations. How do you get at it? Intuitively, through your, through, your, uh, through your zazen, through your sitting. The next line, for the, for the unified mind in, a, mind in accord with the way, all self-centered striving ceases. What he sees here is that when we apply these lessons to the self, we see that the self is empty and interdependent, just like everything else, completely unified with everything else. So that's one side, right? That's the absolute side, empty, interdependent, the same as everything else. But we also know that the self is inescapably embodied and separate. It's heir to all that is human and ordinary. So these two sides are not different. Not one, not two. Unified. This is unified mind. This is mind in accord with the way. When we see absolute and relative, one and two, as not different. He continues, doubts and irresolutions vanish, and life in true faith is possible. Why should our doubts and irresolutions vanish when we have a unified mind? <clears throat> because what we see when we're unified is both our oneness and interdependence with all there is. We see we are something deeper and larger than our inescapable human separateness and vulnerability. We rest in Indra's net. We rest in faith in ourselves because we know that the self is not just the small separate self. It is the small separate self, but that's not all. He continues, with a single stroke, we are freed from bondage. Nothing clings to us, and we hold on to nothing. The bondage that Sang Sen speaks of is the bondage of the small self. As long as we feel that we have a separate self, then we're bound to defend it and its ideas and feelings and needs. But once we give up the idea, that all there is is the separate self. It's as though with a single stroke, as he says, we see things differently and we are free. The line continues, nothing clings to us and we hold on to nothing. How can anything cling to you if there is no you? How can you hold on to anything if there is nothing to hold on to? All things are empty. How can you hold on to emptiness when you're embodied? When we read statements as, such as this statement by saying, and nothing clings to us, we hold on to nothing, it seems as though we just need to wake up 
and we'll never have another selfish feeling or desire, never have any more problems, no more suffering. The reason this is not true is that we have spent a lifetime building up hurt and unacknowledged feelings, building up ideas about ourselves, defenses and patterns of response. And although we may see wake up in a single stroke, we do not work through all our conditioning in a single stroke. When things become hurtful or frightening, we revert to old patterns. Those saying san says we hold on to nothing, we may actually continue to hold on to a great deal. What we see in our actual behavior often lags behind our insights. This is human. This is our practice. This is our life work to bring our insight and our behavior together. First, we've got to have the insight. And then the big struggle begins to bring this insight into congruence with how we live our lives. Next line. All is empty, clear, and self-illuminating with no exertion of the mind's power. Here, thought, feeling, knowledge, and imagination are of no value. He says, all is empty and clear. This is who we are, this clarity. This is big mind. It's always clear. It comes not from the everyday mind, but from something deeper, this clarity. It comes from awareness, from big mind, from Buddha nature. This big mind is always clear and always present. It's always available to us. All we have to do to experience it is to go a little deeper, just kind of go under that small mind that chatters on in our heads. Big mind is always just below the surface of that chatter. Sang San adds, there's no exertion of the mind's power. When we have to figure things out, it's very slow and laborious. But when we act from an intuitive place, the action feels spontaneous, effortless. This is why Sang San says there's no exertion. This intuitive way is how we access big mind. Everything else is of no value in getting there. Only one way, and that's the intuitive way, the way of wisdom. He continues, in this world of suchness, there is neither self nor other than self. Big mind is not self because it exists in the world of the absolute, of emptiness. It is not other than self, because there can be no emptiness that floats around unmoored all by itself. So there has to be a self to be empty. There has to be a small mind to have a big mind. Emptiness is a property of form. Therefore, the two sides, form and emptiness, self and no self, always have to go together. They exist in tandem. Form is exactly emptiness. Emptiness exactly form. In such a conundrum, we can only say exactly what Zen does say. If we want to see the truth, we have to see both sides at once. When we do that, we see the suchness of things. What is this world of suchness? This is what he says, in this world of suchness. So what is he talking about, this world of suchness? He 
He has spent the greater part of this sutra switching back and forth between stressing the absolute point of view and then warning us not to get stuck there. So Seng San is making a major shift here. He's getting near the end of the sutra. And he begins telling us that having seen the absolute, we need to see how this point of view informs the relative. And we need to see how the relative is necessary for the absolute. We need to see how oneness and two-ness form the deepest reality. When we only see the relative, the particular detailed form in front of us, we get stuck in a world with very few possibilities. When we only see the absolute, we get stuck in a world that's vague and generalized, a world but a world with infinite possibilities. But there's no way to embody those possibilities in this world. So the ultimate is the world of suchness. Here we see both the specific, detailed, individual aspect of things this is the part that gives them all their flavor and beauty and joy. But we also see the larger dimension of these particular things. We see how they're connected to each other, how they share a common reality, how the possibility of the absolute world is made concrete in the relative world. I'm going to give you a koan now that talks a little bit about this. It's one of my favorite koans. A high official, while talking with nonsense, said, The universe and I have the same root. Everything and I are one. How wonderful this is. Nonsense pointed at a flower in the garden and said, People these days look at this flower as though in a dream. How does nonsense want people to look at the flower? He wants them to see its suchness. He wants them to see the full, concrete, particular individuality of the flower, down to the ant crawling on its stem. He also wants them to see at the same moment the universality of the flower, its interdependence with all the things of the garden, its place in the whole. So I leave it to you to judge which side the official of the koan missed. This is suchness that Nansen is trying to point him to. So we're almost at the end of the Faith Mind Sutra. Uh, I think probably we have only maybe one more talk, probably be able to finish it up with one more talk. So for the next lines, we need to remember that Seng San is making a major shift here towards the end of the sutra. And he's going to talk a lot about suchness, about unifying these two different points of view, the absolute and the relative. He's trying to put things together for his readers and trying to express the ultimate point of view. Not two, not one.